Good afternoon. This is uh, Jim Bush. Thanks for listening. Um, today, uh, what I'd like to discuss is a strategy I use during week for correcting markets to uncover the next group of leading stocks. Um, and to be specific, what I mean by correcting markets is not the three-day shakeout type of move that we just experienced, but uh, instead a market that corrects for several weeks or several months. So the think of the summer corrections of 2010, 2011, 2012, um, all of which lasted for several months. So these are just the highlights of what we'll discuss today. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of my uh, growth stock screening criteria, just so you have a frame of reference for the types of names that will be, or the types of names that I'll use as examples later on. Um, then I'll talk about how to build a relative strength watch list and why it's such an effective tool. And uh, then I'll just give a few examples of uh, bullish chart patterns in the midst of a correction uh, that led to some really strong moves uh, later on. And then hopefully we'll have some time for uh, Q&A afterwards. And um, in terms of the Q&A, you can submit questions anytime uh, through uh, the chat function that you have there in front of you. So, um, you know, I'll be periodically glancing at it throughout uh, the webinar, and then during the q and I'll try to address as many of them as I can. Okay. So, first of, first of all, uh, for those uh, maybe who are new to the service, I'll give you a little bit of my background. Um, I'm a growth stock investor. I've been uh, trading you know, since the mid-90s or so, uh, primarily in small to mid-caps. Uh, I use a hybrid fundamental and technical approach. I would say probably two-thirds fundamental, maybe one-third technical. Uh, my holding period is generally uh, measured in weeks or months. Um, here at Briefing, I post commentary under the Growth Trader uh, handle. Uh, that's the ZFX ticker. Um, I'm also the manager of the Emerging Growth, Liquid Momentum, and Value Leaders systems. And I also do some IPO write-ups for the next big thing. So that should give you a sense of um, the type of commentary I do. So let's, uh, I'll just give you a, a very quick overview of my uh, screening criteria so you have an idea of the universe that I'm looking at. Um, to me, uh, revenue growth is king. Um, I screen for um, revenue growth in the top three deciles. Um, you know, that's on a percentage basis. Um, so generally, they're the top 30% of all quarterly revenue growth. Um, in practical terms, uh, that usually works out to be, in a normal market, revenue growth sort of 15%, 20% or higher, depending on sort of the economic cycle we're in. I look at uh, gross margins, at least uh, 25%. Uh, generally with that, I, I sort of use gross margins as a proxy for um, either some intellectual property or pricing power or, uh, you know, brand strength, that sort of thing. Really, these are companies that uh, obviously a lot of technology and te medical technology companies have high gross margins because they have a lot of in intellectual property and they're more defensible, their products are. Uh, but you also get sort of the higher end retailers and industrial companies in there as well, ones that have real... Um, you know, defined products with you know, a lot of margin power. I also look for low uh, debt to capital. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory right there. Um, I usually insist that companies are profitable, but if they're on the verge of profitability, say they're reporting net losses of, say, a loss of three cents in the most recent quarter or a loss of five cents, um, I'm fine with that as long as there's a clear path to profitability. Uh, as a second check, I look at uh, cash flow from operations. If they have positive cash flow, then that's enough for me. Uh, in terms of relative strength rank, I use uh, a smoothed version of six-month relative strength. And generally, I'm looking for just outperforming the market. So that means above 50. So uh, let's go into sort of um, the idea of when you hit a correcting market, 
know, what's what's the strategy there? Um, when the market enters the corrective phase after after a multi-month run, I mean, these things here are pretty self-explanatory. You want to focus on preserving capital. Um, what I like to do when it becomes clear that we're entering a corrective phase, say after a couple weeks of very uh, weak action in the market, what I'll do then is wipe my watch my watch list clean. So the reason why I do that is because what I'm doing in terms of the strategy I'm, I'm about to outline is what I want to do is make sure that I'm watching the new leadership groups that emerge during this corrective phase. And if I'm focused on the prior leaders from the last uh, from the last upswing, you know that that can be distracting because when the prior leaders sell off in a market correction, uh, many of them don't come back. So I don't want to be focused on the prior leaders. I want to be watching for the new ones. So it just helps me to wipe my watch list clean. And the final thing here is just being flexible in your outlook. This is a key thing because, I mean, what we've seen over and over over the last few years is just that we've had a three or four month bull market or you know, uptrend, and then everyone believes a correction is coming. Uh, we start to come in pretty hard. We see a number of leading names roll over, and then people assume, okay, the correction's here. And then after two or three days of a shakeout, we're just right back at the highs again. I mean, we've seen that over and over. We, we just saw it, uh, you know, over the last few days. So you want to be flexible in your thinking. You don't want to be dogmatic about, okay, this is the correction. Um, this is what I'm going to position for, especially if the market tells you otherwise. So let's get let's get into the strategy itself. So. When I'm building a relative strength watch list during the course of a broad market correction, how stocks act during a broad market correction provides really powerful clues as to who the former leaders are and who the new leaders will be. When you're looking for the new leaders, what you want to watch for are growth stocks that hold up well as the broad market sells off. So that underlined phrase that you have here on the slide is really this sums up the entire presentation right there. So specifically, what you're looking for are quality growth stocks that basically form these pretty these recurring technical patterns that you'll see uh, as the broad market comes in. You're looking for high quality names that are carving out well-defined horizontal ranges just under their 52-week highs. So in other words, these stocks aren't selling off. They're being accumulated on even minor dips. They may not be uh, making new highs while the broad market sells off. They're just moving sideways, and that's a very bullish sign. Otherwise, another pattern is you want to watch for high-quality names that form an orderly, shallow pullback from the highs that respects key support zones. And finally, uh, watch for high quality names that basically just grind higher while the market is selling off. So that last one is kind of the most difficult one to interpret. But uh, you know, I'll show you an example of one of those and we'll discuss that a little bit more. So the key point here is that the technicals, at least in my mind, will give you a big clue about companies with improving fundamentals. So think about you know, when you get, say, a two or three month market correction. What's really happening is that's kind of, that kind of draws a dividing line in the market um, where your former leaders, you know, they've had their, maybe they were running for six months or a year already and they top out and they start to, you know, basically they put in their top and they start to sell off. And then you get a rotation into you know, money managers are selling off these names and they're putting that money into the names that they think have the best prospects going forward once we come out of the correction. So really the technicals really give you a strong signal that stocks that show signs of accumulation during market correction are the names that funds things have the best prospects going forward. So 
that again is a key line from there. Um, sometimes it may not be obvious. You might be looking at a name that is moving sideways right near its 52 week highs while the market is sort of selling off all around it. And you may think, well, never heard of this company, or I've heard of it, but never thought much of it before. And it might be sort of a curious move to you. But when you see a name like that, you really want to pay attention to it because it, it tells you that there are really no willing sellers in that name. And there are buyers on any kind of minor weakness, even near the 52 week highs. So it's a very bullish, bullish sign. So as you're building a relative strength watch list, I mean, that, that takes some resources. Uh, you can do it um, on your own. But you need to have soft. You need to have screening software that you think is reliable. Um, what I would encourage is basically just using uh, Briefing.com as your resource for it, because the emerging growth stocks system is by design a pre-built relative strength watch list. So as we work our way through a correction, whenever that correction may occur. What you'll see is that the emerging growth stocks list, every Monday when we put up the new additions, it's going to start getting populated by the growth names that are holding up the best during the correction. And so basically all you need to do is just watch the new additions every Monday on emerging growth. And chances are the names that are going to have the biggest rallies once we finish the correction are going to be among those new additions. I'd also encourage you to uh, read the next big thing, which is uh, that's our IPO analysis uh, section, if you haven't seen it before. So um, just focus on the growth names among the, new, the recent IPOs. Uh, there are a lot of good ideas on that page. I would say that probably half of the stocks that I buy usually come out of what I research on the next big thing. And then finally, I would, uh, I would say if you uh, lean more towards sort of the larger cap names, uh, Liquid Momentum is designed for swing traders, so shorter term trades. But uh, a relative strength is a big component of the Liquid Momentum system. So you can also find some good ideas there. So let's get right into an example. Uh, for those of you who've listened to my webinars before on this topic, you'll be familiar with this slide because um, the Isilon chart is sort of my go-to chart when I'm trying to explain this concept. Um, this is what I would say is a perfect example of a stock, a growth stock that shows relative strength during a market correction. What we're looking at here is the uh, summer correction of 2010. And if you look at the blue line, the, that marks the NASDAQ composite. And this, this is actually the flash crash right here in the early stages of that sell-off. And you'll see that the NASDAQ composite is just, um, I mean, for those of you who traded during that summer, I mean, this was a severe correction in the market. I mean, just about nine stocks out of 10 were getting thrown overboard during that phase. If you look at the chart of Isilon here, that moved in a very tight, perfectly horizontal range between 12 and 1450 during that entire period. And that was just a hugely bullish signal to you that, again, no willing sellers in this name. And for those who were selling, it found eager buyers at the $12 level. And remember, this stock, again, is trading just under its 50. This is a high multiple tech stock trading just under its 52-week highs that barely budged during a severe correction. So this is exactly the type of pattern that you want to watch for. You don't see it very often, but use this as kind of your template for the type of action you want to watch for during a correction, especially you know if we get one this summer. This is what you want to watch for. And as you'll notice, if you look at the breakout that occurred in July, um, that did correspond with earnings. And often that's the case when you get these sideways moves. So, Usually, well, I don't want to say usually, but oftentimes the catalyst that breaks them out is a positive earnings report. So that's another thing to keep in mind as well. Here's another one that probably a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, Mellanox. 
this is from the summer of 2012 correction. And what you'll notice is that April, that huge gap up in April, uh, as many of you may know, that was that first blowout earnings report that they had. Um, and what you'll notice is that looking at the bottom portion of the chart, it, as the sell-off in the S&P got underway in May, um, what did Mellanox do? Well, it initially came in pretty hard off that earnings uh, day highs from roughly 65 all the way down to 55. But it firmed, or it formed, again, a perfectly horizontal uh, trading range after that. While the market was selling off, funds were unloading other tech names left and right during this period, Mellanox traded in an almost perfect sideways range. Uh, another thing that I'd like to emphasize about this chart, too, is that brief shakeout attempt in mid-May. Um, when you see a really clean range like that develop, and then you see a brief kind of shakeout or stop flush below that range, and then it bounces immediately back into that range, that's, a, that's very bullish. Um, that's a viable uh, signal right there. So this is another name that it actually didn't wait for its next earnings report to break out from that sideways range because the market you know, bottomed in the first week of June. And this one was basically probably the first one to break out to new highs uh, after that. So this is a great example, I think, too, of just a really well-formed uh, horizontal range during a market correction. Uh, Ellie May is another one that many of you might be familiar with. Um, this, again, is looking at the summer of 2012 correction. And Ellie, this was probably before, I mean, not too many people knew about this name back then during May. But this is a stock that during the May, during the, the, the most severe part of the sell-off in May, Ellie also uh, carved out this sort of perfect sideways range, a really tight sideways range. And another thing I'd like to emphasize here in that May trading range of Ellie is, again, the stop flushes. You have two separate bars here that uh, got well below that trading range. But this is another reason why I really focus on the close um, in terms of I don't set intraday stops, just me personally. Uh, I base my stops more on the close, and, and that goes for my existing positions, but also for positions that I'm looking to buy, I focus more on the close than I do on the intraday action, because these are just stop flushes right here, uh, these two bars that violated that, the lower end of that range. And as soon as you see that it flushed the stops below there, below 15, and then closed right back in the range, and then did it a second time a few days later, um, that tells you all you need to know. Again, that's probably a viable signal right there. Um, Ellie also had sort of another, you know, it broke out from that tight range, kind of meandered a bit during early June, had a bit of a scary shakeout in late June, but it held key support, and that's another sign, uh, that's another sign of a, a growth stock that's showing unusual relative strength, because rem remember the correction was still going on in June. Um, so that was just uh, a really bullish sign, even though it had a few bars there on the chart that looked pretty ugly. It held its 50-day, which is the blue line, and that also lined up with the, that 15 uh, level from the prior uh, horizontal range. So again, this one is this is a good example of a chart that is sort of sending all the right signals during a market correction. So this one, stamps.com, this is an example of um, that second type chart type that I mentioned, which is just an orderly pullback off the highs. Um, stamps.com, that big gap up, they had a an absolute blowout earnings report um, in one of the final, the next to last day of July. And it was the type of, I remember when I saw the report, I was familiar with stamps.com, but I never thought much of them. 
you know, it, was, it just made me say, wow. I mean, where did this report come from? And it was just, it was hugely bullish for the stock. Unfortunately, that blowout report came a day or two before the market kind of crashed in August. So the, this is August 2011. And so the timing was a bit poor for stamps. But given how strong that report was, it's really interesting that what happened was stamps came in with the market. The market sold off in August. Stamps pulled back pretty much in line with the market. But what was so bullish about this chart was that it basically did what you wanted it to do. It didn't violate the breakout zone, so it never took that level out near 14 where it initially broke out from. Uh, in fact, it didn't even close below the earnings day uh, gap up range, um, eyeballing it between 15 and 16.50. And that spike below basically held its 50-day exponential moving average almost to the penny. So it, it basically did everything that you would have wanted uh, a breakout to do. And again, this is occurring in the context of an incredibly weak market where a lot of tech stocks were just getting thrown overboard. Uh, fund managers were unloading tech. Um, and stamps held on to its uh, earnings gap up. And as soon as the market uh, sort of found its bottom in the second half of August, uh, stamps was one of the very first names to break out. And this is typical for these types of names that show uh, such relative strength during a market correction. So F5 is uh, an example of the, that third type of chart pattern that I mentioned, which is sort of the grind tire. Uh, this is a shorter time frame. This is during the uh, summer of 2010 correction. So this shows you between April, April and the end of July. But as you can see in the lower part of the chart, the S&P uh, was selling off for several months in a very, this was, again, a time when tech stocks were under a pretty aggressive distribution. And most, most stocks were not holding near their highs. I mean, they were getting decimated. F5, it formed a really sloppy pattern. Uh, if you tried to set stops, you would get stopped out. You know, throughout this pattern, you'd get stopped out multiple times. But if you look at it, really just draw a channel. Each month or every couple of weeks, it would set a new minor high, have a sharp correction, generally set just a new minor high after that, correct. And so basically, this was an upward sloping channel while the market was undergoing an aggressive sell-off. So even though it's not a particularly clean pattern, when you draw the channel lines, it's pretty clear that you can look at F5 and say to yourself, this one wants to run higher, but the market is just keeping a lid on it. So as soon as the market finds its bottom, you knew that F5 was going to take off. And this is also another example, this big gap near the end of the chart also corresponds with earnings, um, which is basically the catalyst that finally broke it above that channel. But this is, uh, this is probably the trickiest pattern to watch for. Uh, but again, just think of it in the context of of the market is just keeping a lid on this name. It's trying to push higher, but keeps getting turned back. It just kind of keeps trying to make a, a new minor high every couple of weeks. And it's just a very bullish sign. So once you draw your channel lines, and if you can get that near the bottom of the channel, uh, that's, a good, that's a good level. So again, just circling back to the resources, the resources slide that I showed, um, all of these names were emerging growth stocks by the way. So we, we track our top performers uh, throughout for each year. And so I circled Isilon, Mellanox, uh, Ellie, Stamp. Um, F5 isn't on there because that one had, uh, that one ran as much as 60% uh, while it was on the emerging growth stocks list. And uh, in 2011, that didn't come close to, to making you know, this, uh, I think it's, this is the top 25 names each year. So um, again, that's why the Emerging Growth Stocks list is just a great pre-built relative strength watch list uh, during any market correction. So the 
the obvious question here is, okay, I understand the concept. Uh, the chart patterns are pretty clear. Um, how do I actually buy these names when I see them? Um, first of all, it's very difficult to buy any stocks during a correcting market, you know, especially expensive tech names or just growth names in general. Uh, and, and, you know, there are certainly some corrections when you don't want to be buying any stocks at all. Uh, these are types of corrections that we saw, say, in uh, 2000 or 2008, um, you know, sometimes the market correction lasts for a couple of years and you don't want to be buying stocks during that time. Um, other corrections are the more garden variety kinds that last a few weeks to a few months. And so you really just need to use sort of common sense and rely on experience to tell you, um, you know, your sense of the market action, whether you want to uh, start accumulating these or not. So th that, it, this is more sort of art than science. But what I will say is that generally once a range or a channel has been established, the ideal buy points are at tests of the lower end of that range or channel. So you can set your limit orders you know, just anywhere in the lower half uh, if you want to set your stops. At least then you have clear uh, risk levels that you can use in terms of you know, a percent below. Um, the lower end of that range. Sometimes, though, you know, if the market is really ugly and the headlines are just awful and you just have a hard time, even if it's a high conviction idea, you have a hard time pulling the trigger on it. Um, what I will do in that case, when I have a really strong conviction in an idea, but the market is just really, you know, I don't, I don't like where we're going with it. What I'll do is I'll buy a half position or even a one-third size position um, just to get some skin in the game because I have such high conviction in that idea. And then I'll add to it when, I have more com when I'm more comfortable. Um, there's a little bit more risk in that just in the sense of that, you know, you could be buying a name that, you know, maybe just the market isn't right for it and you get stopped out of it. But on the other hand, if it's a high, high conviction idea, um, you do, and you see a clearly bullish chart pattern, um, you know, you have to get some skin in the game if you believe in that name that much. So that's usually just a really good kind of halfway measure right there. Buy a half position, just anywhere in the range or, or a third position, and just when you feel better about the market or feel better about things in general, you can add to it. Maybe add on the breakout uh, or add when the market starts rallying. Again, that really sort of depends more on kind of the art than the science of it. That's how I approach it. So here's just the key points here. Um, I really can't emphasize enough that you want to focus on the high quality growth stories with strong revenue growth and identifiable catalysts. And the reason why I emphasize that so much is that these have to be, again, if the market is undergoing this multi-month correction, you have to have a lot of conviction in these names to buy them as they're basing or as they're consolidating. Because there are going to be some ugly moments in any market correction that cause you to question whether you should be in the market at all. Um, and so you really need to understand the story and understand that this is a good quality name that you're willing to hang on to. My personal preference is when it becomes clear that we're in a correction is to just wipe my watch list clean, start fresh. Um, some of my favorite names from the prior uptrends, might, I might just add them right back to my uh, relative strength watch list because they're holding up so well. But I don't want to sort of pre-populate my watch list with names that haven't yet proven themselves yet. So that's just my personal preference. Um, and again, as the broad market comes in, look for those technical patterns that I, uh, that I discussed earlier. Really anything that's holding near its 52-week highs while the market is under distribution, that is a very bullish technical sign that suggests that institutions and money managers um, are accumulating this one even at those higher prices because they think 
when the correction runs its course, uh, this is going to be one of the first names to break out. So that's the end of the formal presentation there. Uh, so we can jump into the Q&A. Um, let me just take a quick moment to review some of the questions. Uh, well, the first one is one that actually a number of people wrote in today. Uh, is the will a replay of the presentation be available afterwards? Um, yes, it will be. Uh, we'll, we'll post a link to the uh, in-play site probably tomorrow morning. And uh, another, uh, another subscriber wrote in, um, can you please explain the six-month relative strength? Um, sure. That's it. Relative strength is a pretty widely used indicator. Um, most people sort of understand what it is. Basically, it just tells you how a stock is performing relative to, say, a benchmark or the all stocks universe. I use uh, a smoothed version of relative strength, which basically compares, um, it, it takes the all stocks universe, uh, which is about roughly 3,500 stocks, US listed stocks, and compares the current price to a moving average. So you don't get sort of these big swings in the relative strength rank uh, that um, the percentage calculation uses. So the traditional way of calculating relative strength is to take the price from six months ago, take the price from today, and calculate the percentage difference, and then compare all stocks uh, compare all stocks and see which ones are outperforming and underperforming. Um, the problem is that the, the price from six months ago is also volatile. So you might be seeing a big move in the current price action, but if the stock happened to be moving up six months ago at the same time, you may see a really odd relative, uh, relative strength rank resulting from that. So again, I prefer to use the moving average as my uh, denominator, which is basically a proxy for the six months. Um, the six month ago price. And again, this is on a one to 100 scale, it's a percentile scale. So um, any stock that's trading at 100 is outperforming basically every other stock in the all stocks universe. Uh, something with a relative strength rank of one is underperforming every uh, name in the universe. And a stock that has a relative strength rank of 50 is right in line with the average. So that's the easiest way to understand relative strength. Um, if you have any further questions on relative strength and how I calculate it, you can always email me. Uh, my email address is on the final slide. Another uh, listener asked, can you explain your definition of key support zones? This is, um, this is something that you could probably do an entirely different webinar on. Uh, in fact, Scott Smith is doing a webinar next Tuesday. He's one of our senior technical analysts. He may provide some insight there. But the way I explain, you know, the definition of key support zones is, um, let's see, you know, say, uh, oftentimes the stocks that I'm looking at uh, get onto my radar because of, um, say, an earnings report. I'm a, I'm a big believer in in, um, in relying on earnings reports as kind of your primary fundamental catalyst. Uh, and so they may have a big gap up based on that earnings report when they surprise the street. Let's say like stamps.com, they have a big gap up based on that bullish earnings report and then the market crashes right afterwards. Um, for me, a key support zone would be, you know, I don't want it to violate the breakout level from the earnings report because that was sort of the key fulcrum point in the stock price or in the stock chart. I also look at moving averages. Um, oftentimes, you know, the 10-day or the 20-day are good short-term moving averages, but when the market corrects for a sustained period, um, they're not going to hold the 10 or the 20-day. So usually the 50-day or the 100-day are typically really solid support uh, levels, or they should be. You know, that's where you would expect if institutions are going to come in and support the stock, they should come in at the 50-day or the 100-day, depending on how the chart looks. And the key support level for me is also just based on price. So, for example, in in those stocks where they either form that lat, that perfect lateral range, that horizontal range, 
you have a really clear, you know, say with Isilon, uh, you had a really clear uh, range between uh, 12 and 1450, if I remember correctly. So uh, if, if it closed below that lower end, and especially even closed for a second day below that, the lower end of that range, to me, that's a violation of a key support zone, and it probably makes that zone invalid. Um, if it's sort of like F5, where it's this kind of sloppy grinding channel, uh, then, again, that's one that you really can't say is that stops on if you're already long, because you're probably going to get stopped out because it's such a, such a wide range that it's forming. But, again, you draw your channel lines, and it usually gives a pretty clear context as to where, what level it should be holding. Another uh, listener um, asked for, you know, which screening tool should I use for a watch list? Um, this may have been before I got to the emerging growth part. But, again, I would just uh, encourage people just to pay attention to the new ads. Uh, every Monday on the emerging growth list. Let's see. So look, looking through a few more of your questions. Uh, does briefing maintain any lists of possible shorts? Um, we don't maintain a list uh, or formal list of shorts. I know that uh, some of our uh, trading analysts uh, post shorts all the time, but those are generally sort of situational or uh, more based on intraday catalysts. So the short answer is we don't uh, have any formal list of, of short candidates. Another reader asked where we post the annual performance for each list. Uh, we only track that for emerging growth, and that's every Monday in the recommended reading section. We have a link to that, so you can, and we update that every week. Uh, let me see. How do you guess when the correction is coming to an end, or for that matter, when it's about to begin? Uh, that's actually a really good question. Um, in terms of how you guess when the correction is coming to an end, for me, the best way, the best signals that I find are when I see, again, I'm, I'm monitoring almost exclusively the growth stock universe, the small and the mid caps. So when I see a cluster of the names on my relative strength watch list uh, really start to tighten up, you know, in terms of their chart, chart patterns, really tighten up right at the top of their range, which usually corresponds to their 52-week highs, uh, that is the best sign I know that they're about to break out. Um, you might get a false signal or two in that respect, but generally speaking, once, once the correction has kind of been underway for several weeks or a couple months, what you'll see is that the new leaders, basically, you know, the ones that are still holding up right near their 52-week highs and their patterns are starting to get tighter and tighter, uh, to me, that, that tells me that's when this correction has pretty much run its course. Now, how do you guess when a correction is about to begin? I mean, that's very difficult. Um, generally, it's sort of the same type of uh, technique, though. I mean, I'm watching the growth stock universe, and after a, a significant run like the one we just went through, um, when I start to see them, the leaders aggressively roll over, generally on no news, um, typically that's a sign that the leading stocks in the market are coming under distribution. And oftentimes that is not reflected in the S&P. So if you're only watching the S&P, you're not going to see this. But if you're watching, say, a watch list of 20 of the leading small and mid-cap growth stocks and they all start to roll over sort of successively, then that's a pretty good tip-off. That's, that's what I rely on. And I posted a comment on that recently, kind of fleshing out what I'm looking for under the setup X ticker. Uh, another reader asked, how big of a stop do you use to avoid being stopped out when it uh, whips below the lower channel? I, I, I no longer use hard stops. I, I used to, and I found that I was getting stopped out all the time. 
And so what I do is I base my, I, I keep mental stops, or some people refer to them as soft stops. And I base it on the close. So, or say the last 15 minutes of the session. So I know roughly where the close is going to be. And that has saved me from getting stopped out so many times in recent months. Because again, oftentimes these are just stop flushes. You know, when you have these well-defined range, what you have is, you know, there are a million technicians out there. They're all looking at the same levels, uh, the same patterns, and they're all interpreting them the same way. And you just get a lot of stop flushes above and below ranges. So that's why I have really come to the conclusion that focusing on the close is the way to go. But you know, for, again, that sort of depends on how you define your risk. Um, I tend to take smaller positions. So if a stock sells off and keeps selling off into the close, um, yeah, I might take a bigger loss than if I had set a hard stop. But it also prevents me from getting shaken up. So you have to weigh, you have to weigh that when you consider where to place your stops. Let's see. Um, that's pretty much all of the questions so far. Uh, oh, actually, another one popped in. So on the emerging growth stocks page, uh, that's by the way for those who, have, who haven't seen it, that's separated into a buy list, which is the top 25, and then the holds which is uh, 26 through 100. Um, one listener asked if I could just explain sort of the hold ranks at the bottom of the list. Um, sure. It, basically, that's, uh, I guess you could say that's sort of an artificial divide between the two. I mean, sometimes you find great opportunities, say, at rank 50 or 60. Um, other times, some of the best buy candidates are you know, in the top 25, the buy list. It really sort of depends on the market phase, I find. Um, what we want to do with the emerging growth list is just always keep in front of you a list of the, of the uh, of growth stocks with the highest relative strength, because those, by definition, are the leading stocks. So, again, I, I wouldn't, um, I personally don't segment it into buy and hold per se. But the, the reason why it's labeled that way is simply because we track stocks as soon as they hit the buy list, the top 25. And then, you know, if they fall down to rank 30 or even rank 60, we're still tracking them because we track them all the way down until they get below 100. So they're referred to as a hold. Uh, just really refers more to our tracking system than anything else. So, uh, again, feel free if you uh, have any further questions, my email address is on this final slide. It's uh, jbush at briefing.com. So feel free to shoot me an email if you have any feedback about the presentation or any follow-up questions. Um, you know, I'll be happy to answer those. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you so much for listening. And uh, again, just as a reminder, Scott Smith, one of our senior technical analysts, We'll have a webinar next Tuesday on uh, basically his swing trading strategies during earnings season. So pretty timely since earnings season is uh, about to ramp up. So again, thank you very much.